Hi, today we are going to discuss six data management patterns in microservice architecture. Data, as you know, is one of the most important pieces whenever you are building an application. The entire game is about data. How do you manage data? How do you design your databases? What are the patterns that should be used when you are designing these kind of microservices or a huge application? Uh, what? How should you store the data? How should the data be retrieved? How should it be event sourced? How should you maintain audit logs? Those are all different kinds of questions you should be asking when you are designing any kind of microservice or an application. Data management is one of the most important pieces in the microservices architecture. And obviously, if you are going into a system design interview or in any company, uh, if you are asked to design a system, most likely it will have it will play with some kind of data. And then how do you store the data? How do you retrieve the data will be kind of questions that are generally asked. So let's dive into it. The first pattern is called the shared database pattern. Shared database pattern, like the name suggests, uh, it's multiple microservices sharing the common database, right? Uh, the architecture looks something like this, where you can see that the clients directly call uh, via the API gateway multiple microservices, but different microservices are writing and reading from the same database. So that's a shared database pattern. Uh, it has benefits and uh, drawbacks. Uh, benefits are obviously since there is only one database, it's easier to operate and maintain. Uh, these kind of architectures are primarily used when uh, you have ACID transactions or uh, you can normalize the data. Uh, you can run stored procedures across multiple tables. So those are benefits. But having said that, there are several drawbacks also like uh, it's very tightly coupled between microservices, right? Like if you are using the same database, all microservice has to adhere to that database requirements. So it's very tightly coupled. Uh, there's a runtime interference in accessing the same database by multiple microservices since multiple microservices are uh, trying to write and read from the same database. Uh, there might be resource contention, scaling might be a problem, those kind of issues might occur. Uh, and it is also difficult to satisfy the data storage and access use cases for various microservices, right? Not all microservices might need the same database. Maybe some needs a SQL database, some needs a no SQL database, right? But uh, if you are going ahead with one database, uh, then that can be a challenge. Uh, this pattern can be used uh, if the services are small, if you are okay with all microservices having to do, uh, to write and read data from the same database, and then this microservice can, uh, can be helpful. The next database and data management pattern that we are going to see is called the opposite of this, which is decentralized pattern. Each microservice owns its data. So uh, uh, if you remember the previous uh, diagram, in this diagram, uh, we'll see that the single database that we had in a shared database model, uh, here each microservice owns its own, its own data, right? Uh, and obviously, you can understand there are several benefits to this. Uh, these are definitely loosely, loosely uh, coupled microservices. Uh, you can have different choices of databases as per your service needs. Each microservice can implement its own database logic and data management logic because the database is, uh, is owned by that microservice, uh, which brings to a third point, which is independent ownership and faster development, right? If you have to make some kind of a change in tables or some kind of a change in structures, it's within stored within your team within your uh, within that service so it does not impact other services directly but having said that this uh, pattern also has some uh, drawbacks uh, if you want a data that can be aggregated across all these different data sets that will obviously be difficult because it each microservice owns uh, its own data uh, it becomes very complex for large applications, if you are building a, uh, a a huge application, which is a tier one application, will be used by millions of people. At that point of time, you will probably end up having uh, tens and hundreds of microservices running for that one application to run. Right? For example, if you are building Amazon.com or Facebook.com, right? Uh, there are hundreds of databases behind that, and if you want uh, to manage those kind of infrastructures and those kind of requirements, that can be that can be difficult uh, and which also means it is very operationally maintenance is an overhead right uh, because different database has different needs they you might have to upgrade you might have to replicate how do you back up like those kind of questions come uh, arise 
but definitely this is one of the patterns that is used in microservices in most of the cases you will see that this pattern is uh, is used uh, you can use this pattern when you want more more granular control of scaling is also one aspect right if you want to scale one service one microservice and the database related to that uh, which does not require a database scaling for another microservice that can be achieved it is it is more loosely coupled in that way one thing to keep in mind is if you are using this pattern uh, like I mentioned directly the clients calling the microservices and that can be a drawback because uh, Several microservices trying to get and pull the data like how do you aggregate those right? So there is another pattern that we are going to talk about later in the video uh, which actually solves that problem The next pattern is API composition pattern. This is the pattern that I was talking about which can solve that problem so API composition pattern basically what it does is it's it builds a API composer which queries and aggregates data from the respective microservices and then sends it back to the business uh, accordingly how whatever data they need so uh, if you if you uh, think of it in this way then it was a, si a similar architecture uh, different microservices are storing retrieving getting the data from their own database now that can be a database that can be a queue or that can be anything where they're persisting or uh, storing the data but from the client perspective they are not directly calling the microservices there is a function an api composition in between which is basically doing the job of calling the microservices getting different domain data entity data and then massaging the data to format it in a way which is useful for the clients right so this is if you are using the uh, decentralized like database per service pattern uh, then uh, it's always recommended to use that with the api composition pattern now obviously as you can understand it, there are several benefits to it uh, it's a simple way to query the data from in individual microservices uh, and one uh, one function one api can orchestrate that data uh, the second is yeah business facing functions can aggregate response as per their need not always you will have a case where uh, the clients are only requesting for domain or entity data right there will be some kind of business data also control plane data also which you might need to uh, massage and that can be achieved using api composition uh, pattern uh, having said that there are obviously drawbacks now what are the drawbacks uh, drawbacks again uh, joining multiple data set is is at times difficult because you cannot basically if it is in one database you can directly perform joins but here it is up to you to implement that kind of a aggregation layer uh, which you don't get off the shelf and apis can be inefficient uh, right if it is not uh, implemented correctly so that is that is a problem another problem i should mention here uh, is uh, your overall system availability right because your api primarily the clients are calling the api and that api composition is calling different microservices to get the data aggregate them massage them and send it back uh, if any one of the microservice is uh, is unavailable that basically completely makes your application unavailable right like your you you might have dependency on all the three microservices as shown in this in this diagram uh, now if say the top microservice is not available but the remaining two are uh, your api will still not be able to 100 percent function so that is it can have a, a reverse implication on availability of an application right uh, so that is api composition pattern the next three patterns that we are going to talk about are really interesting and those are the actual patterns that are primarily used in conjunction with the uh, three patterns that we have already seen uh, and those are the patterns that are primarily used in large scale systems large scale applications right so stay tuned the next pattern that we are talking about is uh, the course pattern so it's it's called cqrs pattern uh, cqrs course pattern is command query responsibility segregation that's cqrs basically it separates the read and the write so the architecture if you see you will be able to understand so if you see the the there are two microservices but the path to write the data and the path to read the data from are separate right so the top microservice that you see that's called command where you are actually writing the data 
that data is getting synced and replicated in some kind of a format you can also have some kind of functions in between uh, in a read database and that is where the uh, clients are when they are doing a query that is the uh, read they read it from a different database so that's the cqrs pattern uh, that basically segregates the separates the write from the read that is the command from the query uh, so yeah th that is in itself a benefit so it is obviously a separation of concern operation concerns because your write is separate than your read if at all at any point of time your write database is not working your reads doesn't get impacted right although that's not obviously you want to have everything working at every point of time which is where the high availability is needed but this definitely gives a separation of concern which is useful uh, this is also required in event sourced architectures and we are going to see the event source arch architecture next uh, and I'm going to talk about that how that can be used when you are using event sourced architectures. Now the drawbacks are uh, like you can see the write actually uh, syncs the data or replicates the data to the read which basically means that there can be an increased lag right that the latency can increase uh, which can bring into eventual consistency state. Uh, there can be potential duplication implementations the coding can be duplicated because uh, it's basically to some extent uh, similar kind of data and that is being written at one place and read from another place so uh, the, the the way the microservices will be implemented will potentially have similar kind of uh, code and the complexity might increase yes so it might increase complexity uh, you can use this pattern if your read and write workloads have separate requirements for scaling, latency, consistency, right? So if that is one of the requirements, this is the pattern that you should use. And in most of the cases, that is uh, uh, likely one of the tenets. So this is one of the pattern that can be used. Uh, this pattern, like I mentioned, it, it results in eventual consistency between the data stores. Like when you write and then you read. Now, if you want to write the data and then immediately want to get that or read that data, it might not be available in the first request. It might take two or three requests to get the data because the write has not yet synced to the read database. And you are, since you are reading from the read database, the data has not is not yet available in the read database. So that couple of seconds or few milliseconds, there might be a lag in getting the doing the read. So whenever you are using this pattern, keep that in mind that it, it is an eventual consistent system. The next pattern that we are going to talk about is event sourcing pattern like I was mentioned. So whenever you are using event sourcing pattern like I mentioned you should always use CQRS. Uh, event sourcing pattern is a very interesting pattern and, and it's uh, we are going to talk about that. But first let's see what it is. So it is basically stored, the data is stored not in the form of data but as a series of events instead of directly writing the say a entity or a, or a, a document in the DB, right? Uh, so you are, so say if you are uh, adding an item, uh, updating an item, deleting an item, those are three operations. Those are the three events that are going to be written in the, in the database. It's not that the item object is getting created and then that itself is getting modified and then that itself is getting deleted. It's not like that. It's the operation the series of events are getting stored in the db and if i show you the architecture it is something it's a bit complex like you can understand and that is one of the drawbacks we're going to talk about that but basically what it is doing first of all it is uh, it is if you see if it is implementing the cqrs pattern because the write is at the top and the reads are from the bottom now the write and read they are getting synced via an event bus right an event bus means the database is that itself the write is publishing events to an event bus and then those event events are being consumed to create materialized views according to the read databases. It's not a direct copy. It can be massaged and accordingly uh, stored as per your needs. So which are called materialized views uh, when you consume the data, consume the events, right? Uh, and the read like the query is from the materialized views uh, again this is an eventual consistent system but one good thing about this is since you are storing all the events uh, as a series of events of all the operations you can at any point of time replay those series of events to recreate your original at any point of time what is the state of the event right 
that is very useful it by default like so and th those replayed events can be used by other microservices also right if they want to know what was the uh, state of the data at x point of time right those kind of use cases can be very easily built uh, and from there you can understand that there are several benefits to it let's look at them obviously separation of concern because it follows the CQRS pattern uh, it can support multiple materialized views as needed and those each of those can be scalable by themselves like you can have since you are storing that in the same uh, in the C by the series of events when you are consuming the events the data store that you create out of those events those are called views and those views can be different for different microservices from that same data right so that is where that gives you a flexibility of the read it's not a direct write from the direct replica of the write database but it's there can be some kind of massaging that you can put before you actually insert it in the read databases and that is a flexibility automatic auditing uh, that i told you because you all obviously store all the operations as series of events so it gives you an automatic auditing out of the box 100 percent guaranteed which is a huge benefit and then obviously if there is a disaster uh, um, that happens or some kind of catastrophe you can always replay the events to reconstruct the data right so uh, it is a disaster recovery mechanism is inbuilt in this pattern however having said that obviously this is a complex architecture and this is also a new architecture let's look at the drawbacks uh, yes there is learning curve you have to learn you have to know how to implement this pattern uh, it is not very straightforward and again there is an increased lag increased latency due to the eventual consistency between the write and the read databases uh, remember if you are using the event sourcing pattern if you're using this pattern you must deploy the saga pattern also and the saga pattern is the one that we are going to discuss next uh, like you can see before we go into the saga pattern one of the things that here is there are multiple microservices right and the write is happening and the read is happening and there are so many microservices how do you guarantee the consistency of the data in distributed microservices uh, microservices because these are distributed microservices distributed applications right so how do you ma manage and maintain the state of the data uh, to be consistent across all of them right and it is very difficult to achieve that and that is the next pattern the next pattern is the saga pattern uh, saga pattern what it does it basically maintains the data consistency in distributed applications so if there are different applications which have different types of uh, uh, write and read logic for the same data and if, if they are interdependent on each other then uh, it basically maintains the consistency of the data like it will not be a case where one system fails and the data is in an inconsistent state across multiple microservices right and uh, there are two ways of implementing uh, saga pattern uh, let's look at those uh, one is called the orchestration and the other is called choreography uh, the 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 application is very simple you have my multiple microservices and you basically have to get the data and in a way you have to perform the data consistency in a way that all systems are consistent right now who will do that the first talks about orchestration which basically means that there is a system or some kind of an orchestrator it is that orchestrator's responsibility to tell each microservice what to do so basically the orchestrator knows when to do what and what is the uh, sequence in which things should be done uh, which is where it is an uh, it, it ensures that the data is consistent across all the microservices so that's the orchestrator pattern and then there is choreography in choreography you can see that it is the the, the pattern is obviously saga pattern so the similar implementation but if you see in choreography the, uh, the microservices the sagas have double ended arrow which basically means that there is no orchestrator each microservice is dependent on an event from another microservice so they are both both the microservices are talking to each other via events right so in the case of orchestrator pattern it's the orchestrator that is responsible for talking to all the microservices but in choreography pattern all microservices are talking to each other in a sync in a way that each of them know what is going to come before them right uh, so that is where the choreography and that is by that they implement the data consistency 
so uh, there are obviously benefits and uh, drawbacks of all patterns similarly for this pattern also uh, benefits yes maintains data consistency across several microservices so this is one of the biggest benefits and possibly the only way that you can do this is by using a saga pattern right you can roll back if something fails at one place now it is obviously possible that one of the sagas one of the microservices fail then how do you maintain consistency uh, like transactions like you can basically do that using the saga pattern and obviously there is a clear separation of concern right uh, it simplifies the uh, the business logic and then what are the drawbacks the drawbacks again there is a learning curve this is also one of the very difficult and complex architectures it is difficult to debug uh, so you have to you have to really know and uh, understand like if you are new to this you should do a poc see whether how things are working but if you are able to implement this then this is a very useful pattern and also used several places in the in the industry now you can use this pattern if you're uh, basically if your application needs are that uh, that uh, you, there should be data consistency across multiple uh, microservices if that is one of your need right without any tight coupling like with loose coupling so that is one of the ways that you can achieve that uh, if there are say a long uh, time consuming transactions that are happening and you don't want to wait on one microservice orchestrator pattern can be very useful for that like you can actually orchestrate like if it is taking so much time then do this if not this then do this it, it's kind of a workflow it's kind of a flow right so uh, that can be built very easily so these are the six data management uh, patterns in microservice architecture uh, hopefully this was useful